All right, thank you and, and welcome to What Physicists Do. I'm uh, very pleased to introduce Dr. Stephen Martin. Uh, he's a data scientist at Grand Rounds, uh, Inc. Uh, that's um, in the field of health sciences. You'll be, you'll be able to talk about this transition. In fact, we're getting kind of a, an academic life story, I think, is, <laughs> yeah. is what we'll get. Um, uh, Dr. Martin's um, undergraduate work was starting off in the CSU system, you know, CSU Chico. He was just describing how that, that was a, a fine physics education, and then he went to University of Minnesota, um, where he completed his degree, but he very much enjoyed his, uh, his time in the, in the CSU. Uh, then he went on to his PhD in physics at UC Santa Cruz. Um, with an uh, emphasis on um, uh, computational biophysics and fluid mechanics. Um, and so uh, I uh, heard of uh, Dr. Martin uh, because of his work uh, and, and, and part of this program still back at UC Santa Cruz called IC, the Institute for uh, Scientists and Engineer Educators. Um, and what was really neat was to be able to connect it with someone who has, has been through a PhD program, but has like, transferred into, um, into a career not directly related, uh, although you'll, we'll find the ways that it connects um, to, to his academic path. Uh, but I think this one is especially good out there for all the, the students, especially the physics majors, for you to see uh, a really interesting um, career path. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Stephen Martin. All right, thank you. Um, I have to say, it, it's, uh, it still feels pretty weird being introduced as, as Dr. Martin. Uh, I graduated, uh, I, I finished my PhD only like six months ago, so that's, I'm a little unnerved. Um, also, I was, I was told this, like, this is wonderful. I, I was, this room was described to me as a large lecture hall, and that, that just absolutely blows my mind. This place is great. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so yeah, like he said, I finished up at Santa Cruz. I work at Grand Rounds, Inc. now. So I'm going to tell you about just what I did in grad school and, uh, and how I got here. So I'm basically just going to start off with a brief about me, just an introduction to my background and that sort of thing. Uh, and then the talk is basically going to follow a three-part structure, basically just starting with what my research was in grad school. How did I transition to, from you know, a physics PhD to working at a tech company. And beyond that, just what, what is the tech company that I do and how, how, is, it, uh, how is it that my, my, the tools that I learned in grad school even apply? So uh, about me, as he mentioned, I have my, you know, I had a bachelor's in physics. I first went to Chico State uh, and then I transferred to University of Minnesota. Uh, while I was there, I did my thesis in, uh, in simulations of liquid crystals. Uh, so that was, that was the, the research was, was pretty enriching there. Uh, I then took a three-year break between undergrad and grad school. I joined the Peace Corps, and I taught in Namibia for two years and some change. Uh, I made some interesting choices with facial hair, uh, and then I uh, spent six years at Santa Cruz doing Can that. Can you use the laser pointer to show oh. your interesting choices? In yeah, uh, that one is me. I'm not sure if you figured that one out. But uh, yeah, my, my interesting choices in facial hair uh, are mostly on my upper lip, uh, so, and we all have to make mistakes, so luckily most of this was off camera. Um, so I, I'm just going to jump right into it. I'm, let me talk about my research at Santa Cruz, what, uh, what I did there. Um, so for, uh, let me just go back here. This is a really, this is a mouthful. I think this was the title of my, of my dissertation. So I'm going to try to break down like what the title means. Um, so I'm going to start off with active here, the active polymer arrays. Active matter has been a topic in, uh, it's been an interesting topic in, in like physics and statistical mechanics for quite a while. Um, but basically it, it's interesting because if you think about like fluid mechanics and how, like how the equations of, you know, the old, you know, uh, equations of fluid mechanics came about, no one was considering things like energy being added to the system constantly, but that happens in biology all the time. You have little swimmers going around. You have things that are altering the fluid mechanics where the, just the, the old equations sort of break down. So when this sort of thing happens, you get this, these really interesting phenomena coming out. So this, I should say this image here, uh, this is a bunch of sperm cells 
that they just, uh, I, I forget which type of sperm, but they just let them free in, in a petri dish. And they spontaneously form these little vortices. And it's stable, right? They just start swimming around in circles. They chase one another in these little circles of a particular size. And like they're not, ta they're not trying to do this. They're just, each one is just swimming independently. But the way that they, they interact with each other through the fluid makes it so these emergent phenomena, these, uh, what do I call it, the organized motion uh, comes, comes through there. So this is a really interesting example. Um, so I, meant, I also mentioned, this, these are vortex lattices. Uh, there's also swarming. So you get things that just sort of chase each other, each other without really talking to one another, but they start to organize. And you also get macroscopic flow, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, or in two slides, I guess. So uh, when I mentioned polymer arrays, specifically what I was looking at is active polymers. And uh, in, our, in our cells, you know, and in any animal cell, you have, uh, you, know, you have the cell membrane. And on the inside, what gives the cell structure is, is the cytoskeleton. And a lot of that cytoskeleton is, is made up of these long, flexible uh, polymers, essentially, called microtubules. And on those microtubules, the, we've, we've evolved this very uh, interesting motor protein called kinesin, which as you can see, the, this thing here, I should mention, this is the microtubule. This is the kinesin, it's a motor protein. And normally in cells, if we just want something like sugar to go from one side of the cell to the other, you don't need to transport it, it will diffuse, right? It'll just do that naturally. But if things get too big, they don't diffuse. So you need something to bring it across, you need something to bring it across the cell. And that's what these kinesins do. They walk on these, on the cytoskeleton, or sorry, they walk on the microtubule and they actually transport this cargo all the way across. And that way it can actually get to the parts of the cell that need it. Um, in terms of the physics, uh, it's, the kinesin is actually adding energy to the fluid because as it walks along, it exerts a force on the fluid, and the fluid exerts a force back on the, on the, uh, the motor protein, the, the kinesin, by Newton's third law. And so if you have uh, these microtubules, and microtubules are allowed to move around, you, you, get, this, uh, you get this spontaneous uh, energy always being added to the system. You do need ATP for it to work, like you do need some fuel, but you get some interesting fluid mechanics as a result. Um, this has been observed experimentally, and there's a group down in Santa Barbara that has been doing loads of experiments with, with microtubules and kinesin and the sorts of effects you can get. This is, so up here at the top is uh, active pneumatics. What you get are these, these are like little microtubule strands. And what you get is that they spontaneously align with one another. They didn't set them up like that. They spontaneously align with one another, and then they sort of, they sort of uh, make these cool hypnotic uh, patterns. Uh, you also get, this was a really big breakthrough, spontaneous macroscopic flow. These things organize, are able to organize, in certain geometries, they're able to organize so much that just by dropping kinesin, ATP, and microtubules into a, a container, they will make a circular flow, like a macroscopic, observable circular flow. So, and nothing is, nothing is, uh, nothing, they have no, like, fan there propelling it, it just, it just goes. Uh, and lastly, the one that I was more focused on for much of my dissertation was uh, this thing called cilia-like metachronal wave formation, which is another mouthful, I understand. So I'm going to have to break that one down as well. <laughs> um, so let's talk about metachronal waves. Uh, here's, a, here's an example of one. A metachronal wave really is just, if you have a lot of individual items, like individual, in this case, people, they can make a large scale structure by, in this case, communicating with one another, right? They know they're going to be making a wave, and so they communicate with one another, and they're able to make this large scale structure from these small individual components that are more or less, well, they're supposed to be independent, right? But uh, they've communicated with one another. And another example of this in nature is uh, the way a millipede walks. Uh, you see the metachronal waves there of the, the feet. You can see the large scale structure of the feet, but this is just a consequence of the way the millipede moves forward. And again here, there's a central nerve, well, yeah, there's a nervous system here that's telling the feet to walk like that. So you have these feet communicating with one another uh, to make this large scale structure. What was observed though, in the, if you take, <laughs> if you take these microtubules and you, and you put them between two plates, two glass slides with kinesin and ATP, 
And some of them can get trapped on a bubble. This here is just the interface of a bubble. So here's the bubble here, and this is the fluid up here. Some of them can get trapped under that bubble against the glass slide. And when that happens, they started looking at it, and they noticed that they actually could get metachronal waves, this wave behavior, spontaneously forming. Uh, even though, again, these things have no way of talking to one another, right? They're not, they're not like, there's no nervous system here. It's just motor proteins on a polymer. And they somehow organize into this, into this metachronal wave formation. This was of particular interest because biologists are actually still kind of fighting about how cilia do this. Like cilia in our throats are able to, to make these metachronal waves and that's what helps them expel like phlegm and mucus and that sort of thing. Um, and they're not exactly sure how they're able to coordinate. And so this experimental group was able to just simplify the equation, say here is just a polymer, here is just a motor protein, and we're able to still observe this even if we don't have the, the fancy machinery that a cilia has. Yeah? Dr. Martin, I, I would model asking a question when I should have asked it before, because I don't know if I, if I missed it, yes. but um, ATP clearly oh, is yes. part of sugars. No, it's, I mean, it, it's, yeah. so I, I, know, I know ATP, and maybe not everyone does, but it's, it's part of um, you know, how sugars provide energy. It's, it's, mm -hmm. the, it's the cellular energy. So that's why yes. you're saying you need to mix that in there. Yes. The um, microtubules and the kinesin, which of these are ex extant in real biological samples, and which are, if any, are any a sort of man-made um, features at the molecular level? Are both the microtubules just naturally occurring and the kinesin is naturally occurring? And so you, you parsed in three actual components yes. of human cells, um, one that does motion, kinesin, hence its name, microtubules to give you a structure, and ATP to provide energy and just let those kinesins start running wild. Is, is yeah. that it? This is all, all of these things are present in biology, in our cells, in any animal cell really. Kinesin is a motor protein that's in our cells because we need to, I mean, it's there to transport cargo around, at least that's the function we know of. There might be more functions to it. Microtubules also present in every, every one of our cells. Uh, ATP, like you said, I, yeah, I should have mentioned this, but yes, ATP is uh, what you get when uh, in an, basically an animal cell, uh, the mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell, right? So <laughs> in the mitochondria you get, uh, you get sugar that goes in and then what the body does in order to actually, uh, like the body can't turn sugar right into energy, like uh, energy of motion. What it does is it, it does this complicated reaction that uh, that takes uh, a molecule of glucose and transforms it into something like 37 ATP molecules. It doesn't transform it, it uses the energy from it and then there's a, um, a catalysis reaction that, that, uh, that, that creates these molecules. It, it sort of synthesizes these ATP molecules, it's adenosine triphosphate or something. Um, and that those ATP molecules are what, that's what like muscle cells will use to, like they have this, uh, yeah, that's what muscle cells will use. And if we ever need energy from it, it breaks apart, uh, ATP breaks apart into ADP and I'm guessing a P, I guess. So <laughs> I don't know what's left. I wish I were a biologist, I could tell you. Uh, but yeah, it is just a, a source of energy. Yeah, we can think of it like that. Oh, oh you didn't? Okay. Um, okay, so this is what I was looking into. This is what what physicists now, like people are starting to ask physicists, why is this happening? And that's what my, my advisor and I were, were looking into. Uh, yeah, why does this happen? So to simulate it, I, I will say that I'm just going to give, this was like 30 slides of my dissertation condensed into one, so bear with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have simple forces on the microtubule. Up here at the top, this is the kinesin force. Kinesin are walking, uh, they're walking this way, they're walking outward, so the force on the microtubule itself would be the other way by Newton's third law, right? Uh, you have a stiffness force that causes the tube microtubule to wish to straighten out, right? That's, that's the, the whole idea there. And there's a force at the base, so because these things are pinned to a, a bubble, we need something keeping them there, so I've got forces down there keeping it in place. Um, additionally, this was a lot of my work. This is why I, I also sometimes call myself a theorist is because there are very complicated hydrodynamic interactions. So if there's a little piece of uh, microtubule here that's moving like in one direction, 
it will cause the fluid around it to move, which will then exert a force on this microtubule over here, which causes it to move. And so you have these, all of these interacting forces that make this actually pretty difficult to simulate because uh, you have, yeah, it's just uh, like there are so many forces you always have to add up and make sure you're doing it right. So this is sort of like a brief, very brief, uh, a very brief idea of how the simulations worked. And just, it's, it really is very Newtonian. Just lots of forces and then see where things go. That being said, it wasn't F equals MA, different kind of Newtonian, but uh, it was just summing up forces. Um, so if I just want to give like the results, like I got to make lots of videos, so I at least have some nice, some nice slides there. Uh, so this is, the, this is the experimental one. This was done down in Santa Barbara. This is the one I made uh, that really was, it was just as simple as what they did. I said, okay, well, let's do exactly what they did and drop these microtubules uh, in, in, in this circular sort of array uh, and see how they interact with one another. And sure enough, we see these metachronal waves forming, right? Um, and so that was a nice, that was, it was very convenient that once we had all the math right, it just sort of, it just sort of appeared just like it did experimentally. Uh, however, and I'm hoping you can see this all right. The lighting's a little funny. Uh, but what we found actually was that the plates, the fact that it was observed between two glass slides, was actually extremely important for why they saw this. Right? Microtubules don't actually do this in a normal cell. But the fact that they were between those two plates was central to why they actually exhibited this, this metachronal wave formation. If you have a large plate separation, you get really long waves. So I should say, like, the, the bubble is, imagine the bubble in the, like, on the desk, right? And then the, the cilia are radiating outward from it, or the microtubules are radiating outward from it. So it's kind of a two-dimensional structure. The plates are above and below the desk. They're sort of pinning it in place like that. Um, those plates are central. If you have very small plate separation, you get these, you get really disorganized behavior. What this effectively means is very short wavelengths. And if you have large separation, you get very long wavelengths until if you had no plates at all, they would actually just completely synchronize with one another. And there wouldn't be any waves, they would just be synchronized, if that makes sense. There would be no crests and troughs or anything like that. Um, so the fact that this, that this worked out was actually really nice for us because we had this huge code base. This was all coded in C++. So now we have this huge code base where we can fiddle with it a little bit. Uh, and and we can propose further experiments for this group, and, and this, was, this was a lot of fun. Um, so here, what if the microtubules are contained, right? They, they are in, they're in between the plates, but, and we've contained them, but they're not pinned to anything. So here, like we were saying, well, maybe an optical trap could keep them all in place, or just maybe they're inside of, a, inside of just like a little water uh, droplet, so that they can't escape the droplet. What sort of behavior can we expect then? And what we found is that, uh, first of all, if they're long and stiff like this, they sort of travel around in a circle. They like the edge, and they go in opposite directions. But if you make them a little bit less stiff, they're actually able to turn around. And you get just, the, like, no matter how you drop them, they spontaneously organize into a vortex. So this is similar to what I was saying about, or what I was showing you earlier with the, the sperm cells that were spontaneously dropped, and they form this vortex. Um, and if you make them too short, though, they just get stuck up against a wall. And this one actually, despite the fact that this one looks less interesting, mathematically it's a little bit more interesting, and possibly it might be more interesting as far as um, uh, applications go. Because, uh, because they're all pinned up against the side there, they can act as like a little, um, uh, almost like a pump. Because if they're all aligned like this, then they, then they are taking in fluid from one side and expelling it from the other. You can, if you can see, I don't think you can see the arrows, but here you have the like, fluid coming in this way and going out that way. So if you're trying to do mixing and microfluidics, this might be uh, an idea for an application of how to do that using, using uh, just things that appear in biology anyway. Um, all right. So that's about all the time I have to talk about my dissertation research. So that was the crash course in that. Um, so I'm going to transition quickly into, first of all, why physics, why physicists make good data scientists and how I made that, what was my experience in that transition. 
Um, so first of all, what is data science? This is an important question to answer before I get too far. Um, I took these straight from Wikipedia, don't worry. Uh, so basically, you know, I'm just going to put both definitions up there. Um, it's surprising, it was really hard to define when I was making this slide, which is why I kind of went to Wikipedia straight away. Uh, you have, basically right now, we have ways of gathering lots and lots of relevant data. But we're not, like, it's actually surprisingly, uh, if you have lots and lots of data, it means we have to have very good algorithms to analyze it. And really what's important is predicting outcomes from this huge mass of data, right? So with these definitions, just think of it as like, I have, I have loads of data and I need to come up with something that's uh, insightful, something that's relevant, and something that can, that can make a difference in like a real insight that people haven't thought of before. And I want, I want my computer to do this, right? I, I'm not able to go through millions of lines of, of data. I need the computer to go through it and, uh, and stack it in such a way that it learns something. So a lot of times you'll hear data science almost synonymous with machine learning. Uh, but I would say machine learning is sort of a subset of data science. Um, so why do we make good data scientists? Well, uh, the math, right? That's step one is the math. Uh, data science was more or less developed by physicists, which is really nice because all the math kind of just carries over. Uh, statistics, right? So over here I have, um, I think that's uh, the Planck distribution, like black body radiation. Um, so that's a statistical distribution, basically. And there are loads more statistical distributions in physics. And that carries right over. If you, if you want to do, like, you know, uh, companies want to do tests. They want to test things and they want to know things rigorously. Uh, and so having someone who knows how to apply those tests and who knows the distributions and what to expect uh, can be very valuable. Furthermore, you need to have, I mean, you, know, you learn calculus as a physicist. You have to. Um, Specifically, actually, multivariable calculus. So here I have the like Euler-Lagrange equation, um, but this apply this comes into machine learning quite a lot, at least in a conceptual level. This this uh, formula is the gradient descent algorithm. So that's just something like trying to find a minimum of a function that just happens a lot, and uh, physicists tend to know how to do that pretty well. It just comes kind of naturally. Uh, and then linear algebra plays a big piece of this as well in machine learning. So this is, uh, this is of course, Schrodinger equation. And over here, this is, uh, this is just a, this is considered, a, this is called a loss function, something like that. Uh, it's something that describes how, like, uh, it describes how well, like, a line fits data or how well a curve fits data, something like that. So we have all we have a lot of mathematical tools that pop up, right? We're well-trained mathematicians, applied mathematicians. We also have lots of computer science uh, under our belts. So here I just I stay pretty conceptual here. That's a, a simulation of some plasma, and uh, over here is I mean, if you've uh, if you've ever touched Python, Python and R are pretty common computing languages for for data scientists, and yeah, I learned all my Python. In physics, I learned it in grad school, and it ended up applying pretty well. Um, and for, I would say this is arguably the most, the most valuable thing that comes from, from working in physics, is you get some sort of sense of data intuition. If you work with lots of data, then you start to understand the right questions to ask to understand the data from a high level. So uh, up here, this is uh, the... This is the curve where they discovered the Higgs boson. That's uh, from CERN. And this one's the, the LIGO chirp. Um, and over here, this is, I mean, this is just a, this is a sort of plot you might make, right? You say, I want to visualize this data. So I'm just, let me just try a scatter plot in these two dimensions. And I also want to see the distribution on this axis and the distribution on, on that axis, right? If you're just exploring data, if you, if you work with lots of data, you, you quickly get a sense for uh, high-level things you can do to get us to, to see like okay what do I do next right and that's that's what uh, that's what a lot of companies are really looking for right now um, so this then begs the question uh, do you even want to do it uh, I am one data point right I, I, I like my choice I, I stand by it um, so I, I tried to I have no way of, of, uh, of objectively answering this question, but I will say it's been at the top of the Glassdoor list of careers since 2016. Uh, so people seem to have 
good job satisfaction. Uh, and really, I think one of the big reasons this is at the top of the list right now is that uh, they are, there's a big data scientist, uh, there's a need for it right now. As companies are getting more and more data and they just don't have enough people that are quantitative enough to tackle the role. Uh, so this is, uh, they, they make your life pretty good uh, if, you, if you go in that direction. Um, furthermore, the problems really are interesting. Having large amounts of data, you get some very interesting things that come up. Um, so how do you then get there? Uh, so I will say that if you, like we're in my position at the end of grad school, you're like 95% of the way there. You have the math, like I said, you have the math, you have the computer science, you have the data insight, like you have it all there. Uh, but there are some things you do need. Machine learning terminology. Um, this actually is a surprising barrier because machine learning people, they have all the same math that physicists do, they just call it something different. For instance, uh, the one I thought was the funniest is uh, linear regression, right? Like you just, you take a bunch of points and you fit it to a line. They call that machine learning. It's, it's yeah, it's ridiculous, right? It's, it's linear regression. It's linear regression, yeah. It's like least squares fitting. Oh, that's machine learning. Because, I mean, machine learning is the computer being able to predict something from a bunch of data, right? So, uh, okay. yeah, so if you have a line, that's what the line is. It's predicting if I had another point on somewhere X, where would it be in Y? That's where it is. So it's a very rudimentary form of machine learning. And they call it that. They'll say, oh, what machine learning did you use? You're allowed to say linear regression. Um, that being said, there are a lot more machine learning algorithms besides linear regression. Also, linear regression can get harder than you think uh, in, in certain ways, but yeah, it's, it's not as, like the math is, is uh, not as hard as you might think. Um, the other thing that you need in order to transition is refined senses, I call it refined senses for business value and urgency. Um, the big fear that companies have if they want to hire like a student directly out of academia is they're going to hire them, the person's going to sit there for four months working on a project come up with a really interesting insight that isn't worth anything, right? Like to the business, right? Oh, I found this really cool trend in your data and they'll be like, how can I use that? Like this isn't valuable to me. So I, the idea is if they're gonna, you know, if they're gonna pay you a salary, you have to give, you know, you have to give uh, uh, insights that they can use that is beneficial to the business. And that's something that is a bit of a, that's a bit of a, uh, a that's a bit of a departure. Also the sense of urgency means, um, for me, it meant I have to like actively rein in my perfectionism, right? I spent six years in grad school. I spent three years on a single paper, right? Uh, I have to rein that in. Projects are three to four weeks. Like, uh, if if it's not perfect, they're actually fine with that. You know, I, I I'll present something to them and I'll think, wow, this is this is really rough, and they'll think it's absolutely polished because it's so much beyond what they're used to. Um, so, uh, on a more practical side of things, there are, like, how do you crack into data science? How do you get into it as a field? There are master's programs. Uh, so, D Berkeley has one that's, I think, fairly well recommended, but there are dozens more and they continually pop up. Um, so, that's one way to go in. Uh, there's online training. So, Coursera has a very famous machine learning course, highly recommended. Uh, Kaggle is uh, a website where they, it's interesting, they give you, like, big dumps of data. Usually it's pretty clean data, but it's, you know, it's data. And then they ask you to predict something. Like they hold back 20% of the data and they give you 80%. And they say, okay, now predict the outcome of this. Like if, if we give more data, we want to classify, you know, we want to find a way of classifying these uh, things into groups. And uh, we want to see how well you can do it. And there's online competitions for it uh, to see who can get the best machine learning algorithm that will predict uh, the results, you know the most accurately. Um, so this is a, it's an interesting website. Um, there are some reservations. It's, it's a good way to get started though. They, they, have a good, uh, they have a good introduction to it. There's also boot camps. Um, so if you're trying to transition from academia to data science, there are people that, I mean, it's valuable to companies to have data scientists. And so uh, recruiters have really upped their game. And so it is now a, a business to find people in academia and then 
train them up really quickly in data scientists, as data scientists, and then you know, have them interview at companies, and then the company sort of pays them a finder's fee. Like, it's worth it. Like, like a six-week boot camp you can get for free because the company gets a kickback when someone hires you, right? It's an interesting, it's an interesting business model. It's, it's interesting that it's viable. And like it's, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. So the two that I that uh, actually apply to me, uh, I went through this Coursera course. Again, I loved it. It's, uh, yeah, Coursera machine learning. It's been taken loads of times. Uh, the math isn't too bad. It, it was, yeah, basic calculus, basic linear algebra. Um, and you get through a really, uh, like a wide breadth of, of what everyone's talking about. Uh, and then insight, this is, this, uh, this is one I went through. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this one. Uh, it was, I think, s six weeks, something like that. Um, basically, the idea was they, wanted to, they want to address these two things, right? They want to get you up to speed with machine learning terminology. And, they want, and what you do there is you have, a, like, three weeks to put together a project with value that you then use in, uh, you, you present to companies, and then they choose whether they want to interview you or not. Right, that's sort of the, that's the business model of Insight, is they mentor you while you do this project. And you mentor each other, which is really good. So the project I did, which is kind of fun, uh, was I, I worked with a startup, so I'm calling this a consulting project. I worked with a startup that produced this wearable that tracks blood pressure, right? Uh, and it wasn't like a cuff, right? Normally you need a cuff to measure like blood pressure, right? Systolic and diastolic blood pressure. What they have is a really small wearable which can't measure it directly. You can't measure systolic and diastolic pressure directly from, from like a little patch. Uh, but what you can do is look at the waveform of the blood pressure. You can see the, the shape of the wave. So here, like, I don't know what the y-axis is here, but I know the shape, right? It's, it's a little spiky, something like that. And they've got this inference algorithm that infers systolic and diastolic blood pressure from the shape alone, right? But not all was well. So they, they were doing fine, but uh, certain things will change the shape of someone's waveform artificially. Uh, this is called an intraortic balloon pump. I, I'm going to highlight this part right here. They use this in surgeries and like, uh, you know, if, if there's shock or something, and you just need to get that heart pumping again, you need to start circulating blood if the heart is weak, they'll stick a balloon in there that does it for you, right? Uh, the problem is that uh, if you put a balloon in there <laughs> that, uh, that helps with the heartbeat, and you have this little patch that's helping the doctor monitor your blood pressure, uh, that is going to change your waveform, right? That's going to change what it looks like. Uh, here's a sort of comparison. So this is what a normal blood pressure curve looks like. These are your heartbeats, by the way. Um, with a balloon pump, you have this initial heartbeat, and then the balloon says, oh, is it time to beat? And so it, it has this little lag, and you get this double peak feature. Uh, and if you try to send that into the same algorithm, it just breaks, right? Because, like, how's it going to know that that's the right, uh, that, like, how's it going to, like, it can't relate this to anything. These are relatively rare events, but it's important in cardiac surgeries that you know what the blood pressure is, so it's important that they fix this, that they have some way of doing it. So what they wanted to do was to, uh, they wanted to have this balloon pump detection algorithm here, and all this, yeah, they wanted that. Because if they, can, if they have this thing that detects automatically, <coughs> if you have this balloon pump in, then you don't have to worry about the algorithm breaking. You can either make, like, in the long run, you can make your own, a new algorithm for this, peak, for this double peaked feature, or you can just, um, or you can just say, oh, you have the balloon pump in, everything's okay, because there's probably a, a cardiac surgeon there, right? And things are all right. It just sort of turns it off and doesn't send out any alarm bells. Um, so uh, that's, that's what I did. This was a pretty interesting project, and I'll talk more about it if I've got time, but I probably don't really, so I'm just going to keep moving through it. But these are the results of it. Uh, on the y-axis here, I've got this uh, IABP stands for intraortic balloon pump. This is the probability at every like 10 second interval that there's a balloon pump pumping. And this is the time in seconds. So this was a long surgery. It's 100,000 seconds, so th over three hours. Uh, wait, 100,000. 36, I can do this. <laughs> uh, 30 hours, over 30 hours in surgery. Long surgery. Uh, and at times, the, the doctor had turned on the balloon pump, and sometimes they turned it off. So this is just, after I had trained this data, this, is, this was a very interesting result, because this one had like on and off periods. 
Uh, and so the, uh, they had it logged in there at what times they had turned the things on and off. So the red ones are when they turned it off, and the green parts are when they had turned it on. And so you can see, as soon as it turns it off here, it drops to zero. As soon as it turns off here, it drops to zero, and same thing over here. And in the middle, you get these weird sort of, like at times it's really confident, like up here, but at other times it's not. And it turns out what he did in the surgery is he actually programmed it to do every other beat. So uh, that's why it's showing up in the middle as being like, well, we're not actually sure if the balloon pump is there or not, because it's, it's actually pumping every other beat. Um, so this was, this was a really interesting project for me. Uh, and I, and uh, it, it was on track to go into the wearables back end by the time I left. And I should emphasize, this was a three-week project. It was a lot of fun, though. I had a lot of support. And uh, it was surrounded by, you know, 20 other PhDs. So it was, it was, uh, pretty, it was pretty uh, enriching. Um, so, now that I have that in place, that, that's sort of, you know, the story from there is, you know, I presented this to companies, I presented it to Grand Rounds, my current company, they offered me an interview and I got the job, um, which was great, you know, that's what, what they wanted. Um, so now I'm, I've been working at Grand Rounds for about six months now, I started there, yeah, a little over six months, I started there uh, beginning of October. Uh, and, yeah, I've been pretty happy there ever since. It's a lot less work than grad school. Um, so, here's, I, I should mention, I took a lot of the slides from marketing, so this is going to make, you know, this is going to be very cheery uh, in terms of uh, what the slides look like. Um, but I'll, I'm going to give some explanation as we go through here. Um, so, first of all, I, I should ask, you know, I asked myself when, when I did this interview, does Grand Rounds look like a nice place to work? I did some research into it. I thought, you know, the company looked nice. Uh, and then, you know, and so I'm going to use my objective source again, uh, Glassdoor. And it turns out that this year it uh, placed 18 on, on top companies to work for in the medium and small, like, size in the country. So I was like, okay, this is a pretty nice place to work. Um, so what do they do? <laughs> uh, basically... There are a lot of services that Grand Rounds does um, that you can, you can sort of read through them here. Um, healthcare is complicated. We want to make sure that there's sort of this concierge service that makes it easier. This is offered as a benefit through your employer. So we market to the benefits. We market to HR, like uh, human resources in, uh, at companies, because we want this to be a benefit. Um, and basically, if someone has a complicated problem, or even if they're just looking for a new doctor, you can come to Grand Rounds and they can, they'll find the right service for you, right? So there's, uh, you can navigate your benefits because we have your insurance information. Uh, you can do virtual clinic, financial guidance, like all of these things are in there. You can get second opinions from a doctor uh, and you can, uh, you can schedule office visits, like they'll do that for you. Uh, we'll, we'll verify that the provider you want to go to is in network. Like that sort of thing. Mostly what, I'm, what the data science team is concerned with those is one on the far left called provider match. What this is, basically we want, we want to find the best provider for you, the one that's going to drive the best outcomes in whatever your needs are. Um, so I'm going to give some horror stories. Um, there are actually, like these are particularly bad cases, but some doctors are better than others. Uh, so the particularly striking one, I believe this one was part of a, a podcast at one point, like Dr. Death or something. Um, very, like a very highly rated uh, orthopedic surgeon just like giving out all sorts of unnecessary <coughs> back surgeries and in one case leading to paralysis that could have been completely avoided. And there are other doctors that are also in network and they, they're not like, like health grades and Yelp like all of these other uh, companies that are grading them don't like say that they're bad doctors, but they have these kind of d potentially dangerous outcomes. And this is true for hundreds of doctors actually. There are lots of sanctioned doctors that are still in network for a lot of insurance companies. There are doctors that have uh, poor prescribing habits, right? They'll, they'll prescribe too much uh, fentanyl or something like that. Or they'll, they'll have dual prescriptions that are dangerous. They interact with each other. Uh, and so it's sort of important that we have a way of, of distinguishing these doctors from one another. Um, so what we do, uh, we have data science and analytics. This is where I am and this is where like the physicists and the statisticians live. Uh, I should mention that there's 23, it says data science and analysts. Uh, the data science team itself is 10 people. 
which is great. It's bigger than most companies have uh, because this is a data-driven product. Um, and also we have loads of service providers. Uh, there's registered nurses, doctors, uh, PhD MDs, like loads of medical staff that also are able to give their opinion. So if we think something, we're always running it by them because like it could be there's some explanation that a physicist wouldn't understand, but the medical side would. So it's been kind of great having that, uh, having that uh, collaboration with them. Um, yeah, and this is, that's my boss, that's Jayadita. And uh, it, it mentioned there, this, this, I, I found this out when I made this presentation. She has this paper where uh, she actually simulated an entire human, or a, I believe it was an entire, yeah, an entire cell, which is, which is just like massive. And it has something like a thousand citations or something like that. And then she went into industry, so yeah. Um, so, oh yeah, there's UCSC. There I am. But my picture's not there yet. One day. Um, now, the, these are the, sort of the goals that we want, right? We want these to be, uh, if we're doing an analysis of physicians, right? We want to look at all physicians. We want to have comprehensive look at physicians. We need lots of data on these doctors. Um, we also need it to be predictive. We need to show that, that when we do an analysis that says that you know, we should be looking at this aspect of doctors when we recommend them to people, uh, we need to show that it leads to better outcomes. We need to show that, the, that people that see this doctor tend to do better than people that see another doctor. Uh, and furthermore, it, it should be personalized. And this one actually is more recent. Um, uh, when Grand Rounds first started, there was just sort of the static quality score that a doctor got, right? Um, but that's not true for everyone. I'm going to show this on the, on the, uh, in a few slides. But we need to actually factor in, well, what patient is seeing that doctor? Can, is there a way that we can find the right doctor for that patient? Um, so here's one that says comprehensive. Don't read all this. It's a lot of stuff. We have lots of data, though. That's like uh, we have. Um, I was talking about this briefly earlier, but uh, uh, we have um, uh, shoot Medicare. Sorry, we have Medicare claims. You can get uh, Medicare claims data uh, through vendors, and so we have all of Medicare claims, which is crazy, right? But it's very doctor complete. Most like almost all doctors show up in there. Um, we have claims from the customers. If, if a customer offers us as a benefit, it's very common for them to say, oh, here's all our claims. Run an analysis on it and see if there's something that is happening with our patients, right? Something that's happening with our employees. Uh, and then there's all sorts of things. There's, we look at, you know, we look at what board certifications do they have? What, uh, what fellowships did they do? What, what medical school did they go to? And uh, yeah, we just sort of gather all these things together and try to like put them in the same place and then run a, a big sort of holistic analysis on these providers. Uh, and then the startup, this, this is a startup, but it's been around for about five years. And so the data science team has been able to do quite a lot. There are hundreds of these analyses that have been done and each one of these is called a model. Uh, it's something that's predictive of outcomes. It's a machine learning model. It predicts outcomes based on features, inputs, um, and the one big problem with this though is that there's no way to give like, how can you give a doctor one score, right? There's hundreds of ways to evaluate how good a doctor is, and some doctors are going to be better than others at one thing, but worse at, at another thing. So we sort of have to look at it, uh, we have to look at all sorts of things. Um, and then from all of those, all of these models, we sort of aggregate them together and then say, okay, is this, a rec is this a good doctor? Is this like a really, really good doctor to recommend to this patient? So it's kind of a daunting task, right? Um, oh, let's see. So um, here's, here's all the models again. Each of these dots is a model. Uh, the emphasis here is that this is, uh, Institute of Medicine has quality dimensions, and we want to show that we're showing up on all six of them. In addition to looking at things like how do you develop complications after surgery, we also look at things like do you retain your patients? Do your patients like you? Uh, are you available for appointments? Uh, do you have like, uh, like, yeah, there's just all sorts of different dimensions you can look at. Oh, med adherence is an interesting one, right? How, when, when patients see you, do they tend to adhere to their medication? Are your instructions clear about how important it is to stay, stay with your meds? 
Uh, like there's all sorts of ways we can look at this and where doctors have interesting differences in how they, in how they uh, give care. Um, so I mentioned that there is machine learning involved. Um, Netflix, Amazon, FICO, all of these are well known for using machine learning as like recommender systems. So here you have Netflix showing you like, this is recommended for you, right? How do they do that? They don't have an intern going like, huh, I wonder what, I wonder what they would like. They have an algorithm that says, okay, you have, you're, you're watching movies that tend to have these similarities. Here are other titles that have those similarities. And it does it automatically, which is really interesting. Um, and Grand Rounds is doing similar stuff, right? They're, they're looking at predicted mortality rate by looking at, at a doctor, right? If, if a doctor has similar behaviors as other doctors, uh, and those other doctors have a high or low mortality rate, then we can infer a mortality rate for the, for the, the physician that we don't have that data on, which is, which is kind of a, an interesting thing to try out. Uh, and it's, what's really nice about this in my mind is that this is a healthcare company, right? When I came out of grad school, like, I wasn't thinking like, oh, I want to go work at Facebook and help people. I, I want to sell ads, right? Which is what a lot of data scientists end up doing. Uh, I, I found a company that is mission driven, that, uh, that works in healthcare and actually is making, I, I, I like to think it's making people's lives better. Yeah. So is Grand Rounds the only healthcare that uh, does this data or the other healthcare companies that does the same thing? We have competitors. Uh, one, <laughs> I, I, I like this uh, Cast Light. I, so there's, every competitor offers like a slightly different service. I would say Cast Light is probably the most similar one. Um, but they, they went public and then they tanked uh, because an academic study came out showing that they didn't actually drive the outcomes they said they did. Um, so there's that, like Teladoc offers similar services, but they don't do the modeling like we do. They just offer a lot of the second opinion services and that sort of thing. Um, and I think like, like Accenture, Quantum Health, there's, there's a few of them out there. Um, it is, it is a, a, you know, it's a competitive space. Um, I think though that we sort of have a unique story behind it though. Like it, we, we really do focus on the data science element of it. Um, so if it all works out, then, uh, then it's something that is gonna be pretty attractive because if you're, if you're using a, if you have to hire a nurse every time someone calls you, or you know, if someone calls you and you, basically you have a, a, a huge team of nurses answering all these questions and arranging healthcare things, it's gonna cost a lot of money and it's gonna be prohibitive for companies to offer as a benefit. Um, yeah, this, this might be way more than, than you asked for, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's what a lot of our competitors are doing though. They're, they're doing big teams of nurses that are answering these questions and what the startup is trying to say is, well, can we, can we achieve the same outcomes without the fleet of employees, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so about personalized care, like we're looking for care that's right for people. Beyond just finding like, the right specialty, right? We don't want to send you to a podiatrist when you have a heart problem. Um, even if you're just looking for a primary care physician, like family medicine, internal medicine, something like that, um, different primary care doctors have different strengths. So if you're young and healthy, then there might be a, a doctor out there that's very good at like preventative care, patient retention, and screening, right? That's what you need if you're young and healthy. You need someone that's gonna like make you come back because that's the problem that people have when they're young and healthy, they don't see doctors. <laughs> and you have someone who, uh, who isn't afraid of giving you the right screenings that you should be getting. That being said, if you, if you have uh, diabetes with high risk of future complications, you're gonna go to the doctor anyway. You don't necessarily need high patient retention, but you will need someone who's experienced with treating diabetes. And uh, here, chronic back pain, you need someone who is not going to prescribe you, uh, not gonna prescribe you addictive medicine at high doses, right? Like that's like that's going to lead to better outcomes for you. So it could lead. So it could be that provider A is best for the the first person, provider B is best for the second, provider C is best for the third. There will always be some doctors that are just you know sanctioned or they have you know they have other bad behaviors that always tend up to, to be at the bottom of the list. But um, but it is personalized care. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to flip through this. Um, what have I been working on? I believe this is a, one of the last slides. Uh, so I have one slide in here that talks really more about what I've been working on since I've been there. Um, 
basically the, the thing that's been going on now is we need to really start to, we have been validating our impact as we go along, right? When we make a model, we simulate the model and say, okay, if we, if we send people to this physician, you know, person A and person B have similar, they look similar, we send them to one physician, how will they do if they go to physician A versus physician B or physician C, right? Um, however, we need to start validating it at a higher level and saying like, okay, what actually happens when people use our product? Or, you know, when people use Grand Rounds, how, how are their outcomes effective? So here's like, so what I've been doing basically is I've been building a lot of tools that make this automatic, that automatically validates each of our models continuously, which is, it was an interesting sort of computer science project that I hadn't been involved with before. But here's an example uh, plot that was built using, like, this is one of hundreds of plots that are built using the tool. This is a uh, cervical cancer screening rates for primary care physicians. And um, the x-axis here is, if the letters are small, uh, this is the quality of the doctor. So over here is high quality, what, what we consider to be high quality providers. On the left is what we consider to be low quality providers. Uh, and then the y-axis here is the uh, cancer screening rate. Like, uh, so what we see is that better doctors tend to screen more for cervical cancers than, uh, than doctors that are lower quality on our scale. And cervical cancer is, like, cervical cancer screening rate is one of our models that we use. So this is continuously validating our models. But the nice thing about this also is we can start to be, be more exploratory and say, well, what if we were to build another model? So here's another one that was uh, kind of fun. Uh, it's also possible to screen too much for cervical cancer. Uh, this is something that's more or less pretty recent that doctors start to recommend this, uh, to recommend screening less, right? But what, what was being found is that uh, women who were too young or had certain situations, if they were screened, uh, they had too many false positives, right? They, they were diagnosed with cancer when they didn't have it. And that presented a lot of problems like as side effects from the treatment for cancer that they didn't have, right? So this is not one of our models. We don't look for this. But our quality score here still has a, a, an inverse correlation. We still see that our higher quality doctors have lower rates of inappropriate screening. Uh, and then finally, um, how, how does it, how does it actually look if we track a customer that used us, how does, the, how does their, uh, like in this case, cervical cancer screening rate compare with, uh, with people that don't use our product on average? And at this point, we're, we're still growing, so our sample sizes are small, which means we have pretty big error bars here. But this is the, the I believe, 90th percentile error bars. So it's becoming, it's becoming very clear that this, we are at least driving some positive outcomes with regards to cervical cancer screening. Um, all right, so I'm a little bit over time, but that's, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Dr. Martin, it was good to, to finish on, uh, early on time. We'd like to have a, a group question session until um, five, and then, then we'll excuse anyone who wants to leave. We'll continue with questions if we'd like to, but let's have a few questions now. Yeah, so at the beginning of your presentation, you showed an image from some sort of microscope of your biological samples. Yes. Um, what kind of microscope could you use to image a, a, a biological sample at that scale? Because it was oh like 200 boy. microns, I think, right? Uh, uh, like the very beginning. I think it was your second or third slide. Uh, yeah. Here? Um, no, sorry. At the very, very first. Oh, the, the sperm one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. That one. Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. I just read the paper. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Though. That is pretty small, right? That's 200 microns. Here's 20 microns, so sort of zoomed in. Uh, yeah, I don't think you can use an electron microscope on. Yeah, I don't think you can if it's in fluid like that. Uh, it must have been optical. Um, but yeah, that's. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure though of the, the specifics of that, though. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Uh, yeah. I think uh, you, you had one slide where you had the pictures of several of your team members, I guess. Uh, and uh, just above it was their various backgrounds, one yeah. of whom was atmospheric science. <coughs> um, 
which led me to sort of wonder. Um, get closer. Yeah, I'll get there. Okay. Uh, uh, there we are. Uh, PhD in bioengineering, computer science, theoretical physics, atmospheric sciences, computational biology. So my, my question for you was in order to get to where you are as a data analyst, your path is through physics. Of course, you're here to testify the, the efficacy yeah. of your preparation here. But my question is, is, how about if you were a chemistry major or biology or what other uh, tracks in academia might be as good a preparation as you should? Oh, um, so if you're looking like, uh, yeah, so to get a, um, I guess to be the most appealing, anything that involves, well, most most STEM uh, PhDs now involve some sort of coding, but if you if you are involved in like simulation, like in this case we had um, like she did a large scale uh, biology simulation. She sim simulated the entire cell. I think this is at Stanford. Um, Eric, uh, he worked. Uh, he was also at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, he did. Uh, dark matter simulations, like uh, just different models of dark matter. Um, so anything where you simulate, and that, that happens in, you know, happens in chemistry. If you want to do like, uh, um, like physical chemistry simulations, uh, material science, uh, biology will have, you know, like y if you want it like a, if you want to make a solid case, then it makes sense to go beyond just an analytical solution these days and go straight into like, okay, well, let's, uh, let's just like set some ground rules and then let the system go and see what it does, right? And so it's really common in a lot of labs that even if it is just, even, even if it is uh, an experimental lab, uh, there will be a simulation component. It, even if it's a, uh, uh, if it's a purely theoretical lab, there's usually a simulation component there as well. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of these uh, a lot of these PhD programs will will get you up to speed. Statistics, even um, economics. People from economics are coming in um, because they're doing like econ economists are now simulating to see, you know, well, is, are these rules that I've come up with does it make does it make I was going to say physical sense, but I guess I should say fiscal sense. But uh, yeah. Yeah. My question is um, that transition from your work to this work. I mean, you, you said how you were able to go about it, but what's the germ of the idea to to pursue that? Oh, the germ. Um, I heard about it. I heard about data science uh, a few years before I graduated from other people at my institution that went into data science and were happy with the choice. Um, the I think the germ of the idea for me was um, I had this uh, basically I, I started looking into it and saw how interesting the problems were and how interesting I should say the tools were that were being used um, like linear regression isn't that interesting but there are lots of other tools that that are you know predictive right that, that are machine learning tools and algorithms that come together and uh, and I, I started getting really interested in this, and I thought, well, like, what if, I guess one thing that really came to it was, like, well, what if I could use this to, like, you know, actually, like, move the needle, like, make some impact somewhere? Um, and I think that's where, I think that's where the seed was sort of, sort of planted. I was looking at, uh, uh, I was just looking at how can I sort of maximize my impact with this, with my skill set and my interests, if that makes sense. We're going to continue with questions, but those of you who need to leave, please do so quickly and quietly. We'll take uh, I'd say, I mean, it was like, I spent at least three years in grad school before I was like really useful, I think. Like it, it was like coming up to speed with a lot of stuff. It wasn't just biology either. I had, um, before coming to grad school, and even like in my entire life, I've only taken one computer science course, right? Like it like. In, in a class, and that was C++ at University of Minnesota. Uh, so I knew how to code in C++, but um, Python is so much nicer. And so like, I, like my, uh, my advisor, I, um, I started working, working with my advisor after he taught a couple of my classes, and he, his homework assignments were in Python, which is great. Like I, I thought it was like, uh, he would write some code. He, he sort of had like some 
the beginnings of code, and then you would need to modify the code to simulate something, or you know, simulate something slightly different, just to show that you understood all the pieces of the code and how how it all worked together. So like, yeah, coming up to speed with biology and with computer science and fluid mechanics. I had not taken a fluid mechanics course in undergrad, so I needed to I needed to get up to speed on that as well. Um, but yeah, a few years in though, it was, uh, started getting fun. I was wondering if you sometimes wonder about the quality of the data that you're working with. All the just, time. just because my impression is that biological systems studies are much more oh. difficult than physical systems. And there are so many variables, and within biology there's so much pressure to study, publish, and I wonder about the quality of, of the information that's available to you. Yes. Um, yeah, that's absolutely a valid concern uh, is yeah if, if you have a lab that's pumping out a whole bunch of papers how can we re like you know like some fraction of them are going to have a vital mistake in them that nobody caught right um, the uh, the lab we were working with um, I believe other groups did replicate their results because it was it was in science so it was kind of a big deal so I believe there are other groups that replicated their results after they got that that metacronal wave formation. Um, and the purpose of it, it, you're right though, there are loads of other variables in biological systems that are hard to account for. The beauty of this sort of project though is uh, with them was that it was a very simplified system, right? People were trying to simulate cilia and like trying to like figure out what are all the little bits and pieces of cilia that get them to they get them to interact with one another. And they said, well, let's take out all of the complicated stuff, just have these polymers with these motor proteins walking down them, and then they interact with, you know, and then they just interact with one another. And they still got this, this phenomena that, that came out of it. And that was the sort of philosophy behind, uh, behind our paper as well, the, the, um, uh, the simulated version is that because, like, the, the appeal of it was that there were so few ingredients that you needed to get the effect. Uh, if, you, if we had 30 different parameters that we could twiddle all the, all the ways we wanted to, it actually wouldn't be that hard to get metachronal waves out of, out of our system. But the fact that we just had a few forces, and they were all completely physically rooted, there was just no phenomenology in there at all. Uh, that's, I think, what, that's what really appealed to me about it, was that you had all these, yeah, it was from all like well, well understood forces. And you're able to get the same, yeah, you're able to get the, the observed phenomenon. Dr. Martin, a follow-up, I mean, if I remember your thesis title or a paper title, it had emergent in it, Emergent, right? yes. So if you could, for the, um, the group, talk about the emergent phenomenon in, in, yeah. in, in, in this. I mean, basically, we're just oh. talking about it, but it, it may not be universally. Uh, yeah, known. yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so uh, if I say emergent, uh, all I mean is that we did not impose this order on the system. Like the system has this order to it, and we didn't impose that. We dropped everything in there. It landed, ran it landed randomly, uh, or maybe not randomly in this case. Like here, it's you know it's pinned to the pinned to the bubble. But they didn't like spend time organizing all these things to make sure they were parallel to start with, and then let them go. They they uh, started the system off randomly, and then it spontaneously formed this order. That's, so that's what we mean by emergent phenomenon. If it spontaneously aggregates, it spontaneously builds this order, uh, this, this sort of entropy reversing event, then we, we'd say it's like a, an emergent phenomenon. Um, so like here also, uh, when I simulated these, I did not drop these in with any particular order. They, they were all dropped in there randomly. And they spontaneously started, they, they, they spontaneously moved to the edge and swam that way. And here they spontaneously moved to the edge and gradually ended up turning themselves around so that they all started going in a circle. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's, what, that's what I largely mean. So you have a slide that had like about the heart, the blood pressure in the heart. Yeah. So uh, the question I was asking you about the health, about like any other health companies you know, doing something similar like that, because um, my dad goes to Kaiser, and he had like a heart issue or something, like the blood pressure, 
So they gave them like they put them in some sort of like I don't know like some sort of group like machine thing that checks like you know like that helps them uh, circulate the blood pressure. I don't know. If it was like some sort of same thing with data that we were showing. Um. So other companies that do these sort of wearable blood pressure technology, I believe there are other companies that do it. Uh, I actually, <laughs> uh, the company it's, itself that I worked with was kind of like, they, they weren't like, um, I guess, uh, they weren't like very, uh, they were pretty secretive about their product, even with me, because they were so early in, in their startup. So they didn't want to like reveal too much about the technology because then I might like sell it to one of their competitors or something like that. So yeah, I don't I don't know the uh, uh, this is sort of the high level part and it's basically all I know. Yeah, I was just kind of curious about. Yeah, because, like, I imagine by now they're I like this, the whole space is moving so fast. I imagine by now there's something out there that's uh, that's monitoring blood pressure. Yeah. I mean, we see how timely this is, right? You know, I mean, my wearable here is, yeah. you know, like, t it tells my pulse and things like this, and the previous generation, you know, didn't have that, and, uh, and we are moving to this uh, kind of uh, Star Trek future yeah. of, of sensing our own, own, own health at all times. Yeah, a lot of these companies, a lot of the wearable companies are, like, their main goal is to be acquired by something like Fitbit or something like that, where their technology gets integrated into an existing device. Um, and that's a viable, you know, it's a viable strategy to do that. But yeah, it's interesting how how the how it all plays out, though. Well, I'd like to ask because I, I know, um, and this wouldn't obviously be related to you if you just started and so on. But do you get a sense? Uh, I got a sense of, of Bay Area, you know, in tech jobs having these sort of time horizons, you're kind of at a place, yeah. and, and, and I'm not even talking about poaching or whatever, there's just sort of a natural life cycle of, of my, my friends who are in tech to kind of move from place to place. Is that generally known? Is that, yeah. is that, is that true, you know, that, that people say, oh, okay, when you, when you go into these this career, the old careers where you go to I, IBM or AT&T Bell, Bell Labs as a physicist in industry, yeah. and you're there for, for your life. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the current culture seems to suggest without really talking about your, your path, obviously? Yeah, I, I, I like this job. I'm going to try to keep it. But, uh, yeah, um, I do believe that's still the culture. Even, I mean, at this company, it's, the company itself has only been around for five years. Um, so, but there is some, like, there is still uh, quite a bit of turnover. Oh. I don't know, the company itself, the, the entire company is about 500 people, uh, and it is growing extremely quickly. Um, but, I mean, I don't think there's as much turnover as at other companies because, like, they treat you pretty well. It's like, at least the data science team, they, they, they seem to, uh, to treat you, yeah, like, it's, you don't work more than 40 hours a week. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, they're very generous with vacation policy and, and that sort of thing. It's just very pleasant in that way. So, like, I, I don't think I would want to take the risk of trying out another place if I, if I don't know the culture already. But, uh, yeah, I, and I get that impression from a lot of employees. Like, we have a lot of people there that have been there for, you know, three or four years. Uh, and a lot of that's because, you know, and they haven't left because they're, they're happy with it. But... I agree, though, that it is like it's sort of the expectation almost that a lot of these companies that you you work there for two years and then you take off. Yeah, I wanted um, to make sure that that's like you know that, that that is a change from an older model from it, but it's informed how I talk to students about career paths because yeah, that's absolutely uh, true. Career paths can be measured in these very discrete am amounts of time. At some level, you could say you did a PhD that's this exploratory period, there's scientific results, um, it was a part of your phase of your career path, but, you know, the next step was over here at something very different, and I'm not speaking about you or your path, but for many people you might find that they're following one path to another, and, and it's the skills you learned in yeah. something like a physics degree and in your coding that allow you to kind of move uh, a, the general person, not you, but move yeah. from thing to thing. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it, it turnover is like it is sort of expected, especially in the Bay. 
Um, so you see some of it, but I just have to catch myself there. Um, you see some of it at Grand Rounds. I think it is less than other companies. Uh, I'm still, I'm, I should mention, I'm still learning a lot. Like there's, there's a, a whole lot to catch up on in terms of uh, uh, working for a company, like the skills they expect you to have. Um, I've learned SQL, which is like, I, I hadn't known that before, but it's fun language. Uh, I've learned how to, you know, <laughs> I, when, I was, when I was doing my simulations in grad school, it was basically just me working on the simulations, especially for the past couple, for the last couple of years. Um, but now I'm working on a code base with 10 people. And so we have to have this organized way, we have to use GitHub and have this organized way of building our code base and reviewing each other's code and that sort of thing. So that's been like, it's all been a pretty big learning experience there. Yeah. Yeah. Just to follow on that, where do you see yourself in 10 years? I don't know. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, oh man, if uh, I, I mean, it depends a lot. I, I could see myself. It, it depends. I think a lot of the fate of, on the fate of this company. I do like this company a lot. So, like, if they succeed, then I wouldn't mind if I just stayed there. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like, I, I could. I, I like the idea of finding companies that are mission driven. Like that's, that's really what I'm looking for. I'm not really interested in working for Google or Facebook for that reason, unless it's like, like there are certain subsets, like certain parts of Google that I think are really cool. Like Google is actually moving into the health space a little bit, but like, I don't think I want to work for Facebook or something where I'm trying to sell ads. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think like a mission driven company, if that means I stay at startups for 10 years, I guess that's fine. Um, if you know, of course, it's also possible that Grand Rounds IPOs and all my stock options, you know, <laughs> that might work out too, and I, I could just retire to Colorado or something, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any further questions? Yes, John. It's kind of a general question. A company like Apple uh, offers, uh, well, they offer restaurants, they offer health care, yeah. they want you to stay and, and work there. Is Grand Rounds like that or no? I mean, there's no, uh, so they don't have like a cafeteria like Facebook or Google has. Uh, they're, not, they're not big enough for that. They do have a, uh, like they have, they have food there. Uh, that's nice. Um, and especially coming out of grad school, the data science team, it, it's kind of a weird dynamic because the data science team is, you know, it's one of the better compensated teams in the organization because we almost all have PhDs and we uh, were it's a data driven product um, but we're also the ones that eat the most of the company food because we're all we're, all, we're not like super fresh out of grad school but you know uh, I'm six months out and I think basically everyone is within five years of coming out of grad school so we're well trained to respond to free food um, so we uh, so it's uh, yeah so we, we do get perks like that. Free food is nice. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other any other perks that come to mind. I mean, yeah, there are other there are other sort of like uh, like commuter benefits and discounts and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, we don't have a restaurant or anything like that. Not yet. Well, let's thank Dr. Martin again.